coming and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Christina Rogner and I'm the representative from the 37th House District. Today, Representative Mag and I filed two bills and one uh, joint resolution with the clerk's office to make Ohio the 25th state in our nation uh, to stand up for workplace freedom. These three pieces of pro-worker legislation are designed to secure Ohioans' freedom in the workplace and would eliminate compulsory unionism in our Buckeye State. We are standing up for working Ohioans because we believe that every employee should have the right to choose themselves whether to join a union or not. Freedom is a fundamental American principle and there should be no barriers to personal freedom in this state. Currently, there are 24 other states that have taken a stand for personal liberty and passed workplace freedom laws, including most recently our neighbors to the west and north, Indiana and Michigan. The other workplace freedom states include Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Nebraska, Nevada, North Carolina, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, and Utah. Oh, and Virginia and Wyoming. More and more states are passing workplace freedom laws as they realize that it gives them a competitive advantage to attracting new or expanding businesses over closed shop states such as Ohio. The data is compelling that being a state that embraces workplace freedom yields economic growth. In a moment, Representative Mag will share more of the details with you on, on that supporting data. But at the end of the day, while economic benefits are compelling uh, for why Ohio should do this, it is a fundamental principle of worker freedom which is driving this legislation. As policymakers, we have the responsibility to create an environment where our economy thrives. To do this, we need to make Ohio inviting to business. And we should continue to do all we can to make Ohio attractive to business through such factors as uh, tax climate, common sense regulatory reform, and having a strong and a free workforce. But we also have the responsibility to ensure that our citizens have no barriers. <coughs> so what do these bills do? Well, the bill that I'm sponsoring will bring workplace freedom to the private sector, and Representative Mag's bill will bring workplace freedom to the public sector, and the joint resolution will place workplace freedom on the ballot uh, as a constitutional amendment for the voters to decide. Representative Mag and I thought that having these two bills and then the joint resolution would provide the most flexibility for the General Assembly and the workers in Ohio uh, to decide how to approach this important issue and, uh, and, find, and give flexibility in finding solutions. By introducing these two bills and the joint resolution, we're putting forward a proposal that we believe will make Ohio a freer and more prosperous place to work and thrive. We are committed to listening to all interested parties and working together in an open and accountable way. We believe in Ohio, and we believe in the strength of Ohioans to forge a bright future. Thank you for your attention. I'd ask that you just hold your questions for a moment until Representative Mack uh, and Representative <coughs> Adams have had a moment to share their thoughts with you. Thank you, Tina, and thank all of you for coming today. As, uh, excuse me. As Representative Rogner mentioned, there is substantial evidence that workplace freedom laws support economic growth. Let's look at the numbers and they will speak for themselves. According to the U.S. Commerce Department data, private sector employment in Midwest workplace freedom states grew by 6.8 percent between 2001 and 2011. Conversely, Employment decreased by 0.4 in Midwestern non-workplace freedom states, including a decline in 2.6% in Ohio. The same research shows that population is growing 
in, in employment in the Midwest workplace freedom states by 10.9% for ages 25 to 34, while population decreases in this age group in non-workplace freedom states by 2.3% overall and 6.2% in Ohio. And furthermore, the Mackinac Center employees in workplace freedom states make more money. When adjusted for cost of living, workers in workplace freedom states have 4.1% higher per capita personal income than those in non-workplace freedom states. But of all the compelling economic data, the driving force behind this legislation is still restoring your freedom to choose. We believe that unions have, have the right and sometimes responsibility to organize. The purpose of unions is to promote fairness and protect equality. However, workplace freedom is also about fairness. Strong arming workers into joining a union is not fair. Getting or keeping a job based on union affiliation is not fair. Workers to contribute to political candidates that they do not support certainly is not fair. And perhaps the most com uh, compelling point is that Ohio support workplace freedom. According to 2012 Quinnipiac poll, 54% of Ohioans favor the idea of workplace freedom legislation. Even more telling, Ohio 2.0 concluded that 71% of Ohio voters would support a measure on the ballot that allows workers to opt out of joining a union if they didn't want to become a member. And only 17% would oppose such a measure. It's time that this issue is brought to the table. Bottom line is, every Ohio worker should have the right to choose whether a union is right for them. Just as the right to organize is protected by the government, the right to not organize should also be uh, protected. This legislation is for workers who want more freedom and more job opportunities. Now I'll turn it over to Representative John Adams. Thank you, Ron. Um, as chairman of ALEC of Ohio, uh, this is their fifth edition of Rich States, Poor States. And in, uh, when they're talking about uh, workplace freedom, a 2010 study in the Cato Journal by a good friend of ours, economist Richard Vetter of Ohio University, found that between 2000 and 2008, 4.8 million Americans moved from forced union states to right-to-work states. That's one person for every minute of every day. Right-to-work states are getting richer over time. Professor Vetter found a 23% higher per capita income growth, growth rate in right-to-work states than in forced union states. Regardless what data you look at, it is compelling and it is accurate to say that right-to-work states uh, population growth was almost double than what it was in forced union states between over, over the last 10-year uh, period. Their uh, personal income growth was 11 points higher than what it was in forced union states. And the gross state product growth was 11 points also, again, higher than what it was in non non-union states. The evidence is there, the data is there, uh, workplace freedom is a subject that needs to be discussed and will continue to be discussed until we are the 26th state, or 25th state uh, in America for uh, to have workplace freedom. What I'd like to do is, uh, if you have any questions, I will turn it back over to the bill sponsors and uh, you can go from there. Thank you very much. Okay, we're open for questions at this time. Representative, have you spoken to the governor's office? Have you gotten any guidance from the governor's office on this legislation? Uh, no, we have not. Uh, you know, let me be very clear with this. This did not come from the governor's office. Uh, we, as legislators, uh, it's our you know it's our job, it's our responsibility to introduce legislation that we believe will be best for Ohioans. Uh, so we've done that, and I know the, the governor's been clear in the paper, you know, I've read as well as all you have, that uh, work, workplace freedom is not a focus of his right now. So could it you, did not come from the governor's office. Could you tell us why you think it's necessary to do this legislatively when we've got that petition ethic that's out there to do the same thing? 
Thank you. The question is why do it legislatively? I mean, there's there's several ways to accomplish something, and, and that was why we want, we did both, actually. We're putting forward two bills and a resolution to put it on the ballot. And, and the reason for that is, I mean, so that the General Assembly, you know, as we have these open discussions with interested parties, we can say, well, you know, what is the best path forward? I mean, we, Representative Mag and I know at the end of the day, we believe having Ohio be a, you know, a workplace freedom state is where we want to end up. You know, you know path forward, we're very flexible. Any questions? How do you react to the responses you got yesterday in terms of this being um, opposite of what voters wanted when they voted on Senate Bill 5? Oh, okay. Um, the Senate Bill 5 uh, was about collective bargaining and putting sort of guardrails around collective bargaining, right? It was a limit on um, how much you could contribute to your, your medical benefits and pension pickups. It was, it was guardrails like that. This is quite the opposite of that. This is saying, workers, you have the freedom, you have the freedom to, you know, to join the union, to pay to be represented by them or not. Um, so to me, this is quite, quite the opposite issue. And, and also, if you look at the polling, I mean, you know, Senate Bill 5, as you all know, I mean, did go down at the polls. Um, workplace freedom, Representative Mag mentioned two studies. I'd like to mention a third uh, that showed that overwhelmingly Ohioans are supportive of this issue. That is, Columbus, is Columbus Dispatch here? Columbus Dispatch, I have to be in the room, okay. Um, so the Columbus Dispatch, I think it was March 31st, uh, came out with the study uh, showing that workplace freedom was supported by 65% of Ohioans, at least in that study. I've got it here, and if you want to see it afterwards, we have the studies. So since we're talking about how individual questions related to work, uh, workplace freedom poll, uh, if you recall, individual questions related to Senate, Senate Bill 5 also polled well. Uh, and of course, we know it was overwhelmingly rejected by Ohioans. Uh, and that effort was led by the same coalition of unions, if you will, who will be opposed to your legislation. So how could you have a, a different outcome if the same people are making basically the same arguments against your bill that they were making against Senate Bill 5. Uh, well, I mean, the answer is sort of what I said before. These are two entirely different things. One was putting guard, it, guardrails around it. That was Senate Bill 5. Uh, this is all about freedom, individual freedom to choose. Uh, you know, that, that resonates with people. It really does. And poll after poll show that. So You need to say it's all about Mucci. I just I want to add, add to that, you know, this is not anti-union legislation. You know, this is, I mean, I, I like unions. I support unions. However, this is about the individual's freedom. Uh, as Jose wrote, if you want to be a member, be a member. If you don't, you don't have to be. It's, it's, and as the data shows in other states where they do have workplace freedom, more people move in, higher income, more employment. So we let it up to the world. You know, we support the workers and the union. Do you expect uh, if, these, if either or both of these bills make it through the House and the Senate, do you expect the governor to sign it? You know, I guess you'd have to ask the governor that question. However, I was a salesman all my life. I never woke up one morning in my life and said, guess what? I think I'm going to lose today. So no, I would expect it to, to uh, to pass, but uh, again, that's a question for 34. This, uh, the unions are saying that this allows people to move off the system, that they don't have to pay the, the, the fees, they don't have to be part of the union, yet they reap the union benefits. You want to respond to that? I think the unions have brought that on to themselves. The union does not have to, under federal and state law, bargain for anybody that's not in the union. They chose to do that. They chose to choose to do that, probably so they can get, what you call, the mooching funds. However, they don't have to do that. That's not in law. So again, all this is doing is allowing the people to have the work to have a choice. And I don't think it is, you know, mooching because if, it's, if the union did not want to represent them all, they wouldn't have to. But that's their decision. Hey, Representative, yes, sir. I, I asked you about the. I suppose we should back up. Um, you think you have the support to get this through the House? Well, you know, we have just introduced it. I mean, this is the introducing. You know, we will welcome. I mean, this is a big project. All sides. 
you know, come to the table, let's have a discussion, let's have a civil discourse, and figure out how we are going to go forward as a state. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I mean, we have to speak to everyone. I could just add, yes. um, let's say, I would like to echo that, that we would like to have an open and civil discourse on this issue. We believe it's a discussion that we ought to be having, because if you just look around Ohio, I mentioned earlier Indiana and Michigan most recently uh, embraced uh, workplace freedom laws in their states. You know, it's happening around us here in the Midwest, and they're doing it because they know it gives them a competitive advantage. If you're a CEO, and you're looking at two states, uh, and the, the tax climate, the regulatory environment, say it all equals out, and the, those, those two states are tied. But one has workplace freedom, and the other one's compulsive union state. You know, where are you gonna, where are you gonna put your plant? Where are you gonna bring those jobs? And so these states, are, they get it, and that's why you know, one state after another is, is becoming workplace freedom, or embracing right to work. Uh, and uh, yeah, Representative Mag and I think that we should at least be engaging in the discussion. And introducing these two bills and joint resolution will help facilitate that discussion. And we are just so thankful that all of you are here today and interested in this topic and asking these great questions. Yeah. Uh, could you, you said a company might choose a right to work state over a non right to work state. Why, why is that? Well, um, this, well, because, I mean, they can, they can negotiate with individual workers. I mean, they can pay the ones that perform more, the ones that perform less, less. I mean, and it, gives, uh, it gives the companies, you know, more freedom as well to, to hire and, and fire their workforce. <coughs> Do you have any, um, um, we'll take hers and then over to you if that's okay. I just wanted to see if you could talk about the decision making process in splitting public and private sector into two separate groups. <coughs> well, I'd be glad to. Uh, you know, it's, it, as we mentioned earlier, I just want to reiterate the reason we did these three pieces of legislation is, is to give flexibility. I mean, maybe the General Assembly wants to do the private sector now or the public sector later, or vice versa, or do one and not the other. Uh, we just really wanted to provide flexibility, and, and, and we thought breaking it up into smaller pieces would help that. And it just seemed like, you know, public was, you know, one, and private just they just seemed like natural fits. I mean, I suppose we could have broken them up into different ways, but we just chose that. It seemed like a natural fit. Yes, sir. The joint resolution is the goal to put it on the ballot this November. The way the joint resolution is currently drafted, it would put it on this November's ballot. Um, but joint resolutions can be amended too, so I mean it could go on, you know, any ballot that the, the committee would so choose. Do you have any assurances or commitments from leadership or committee leaders that you're going to get hearings anytime soon on this? Uh, no, we don't. We've just introduced it. Uh, there are two members of leadership that are as co-sponsors. We have 16 co-sponsors. Representative Adams is here in the room today, and Representative Beakey is also one of the co-sponsors. Could you talk, but we don't have any, any assurances we'll have even a first hearing. Could you talk very quickly, uh, generally, about how well Ohio has performed economically over the last year or so um, that the governor was talking about, and why that is happening compared to the rest of the nation if right to work is helping other states? Well, oh, I'm very proud of what we've done in Ohio in the last two years. I mean, we, I mean, we could go on for an hour talking about some of the neat things we've done. I mean, we think from closing that $8 billion gap and red common sense regulatory reform. Uh, you know, we've, we've done we've we've done so many wonderful things that, that we have rid of the estate tax. I mean, we've we've done some neat things that that will help. Like I said before, create an environment that's inviting to businesses. Uh, and so, workplace freedom isn't the only thing. Uh, like I mentioned, there's tax tax policy, there's regulatory policy. So we've done so many other wonderful things that has helped Ohio tremendously. And we're certainly very proud of all the work we've done together as a house with the Senate and the governor's office. So do you think that the growth that Ohio's experience has been in spite of the fact that it's not a right to work state? Oh yes, you're right, because we're not a right to work state mm -hmm. and, and we have experienced some growth. I think the other thing that we need to, to uh, look at is our neighbor to the north and our neighbor to the west have now both became, become right to work states. You know, over time, I'm sure, if, if we look at the data, that they will be taking jobs from Ohio. We're doing a great job now. But we got to continue to make Ohio a place where workers and employers want to be. All right. All right.